Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, distinguished guests. Um, we're going to be talking about sustainable transformation for human development. Um, and I guess the word transformation is a word that most of us understand in terms of its meaning, scale, and scope. Um, I would probably like to start off by making one assertion, and that assertion is that whether it comes to reducing climate, the impacts of climate change, achieving sustainable development, or even realizing um, energy, food, and water security, we cannot do this without transformation. So the word transformation is a hugely important, important word. Um, the point, I guess, that we need to make is um, in terms of science, technology, um, and innovation, how these three can constitute the blueprint um, when it comes to sustainable development and also when it comes to um, this notion of a shared prosperity. Um, the kind of transformation we want um, is not necessarily um, transformation that will happen in huge radical shifts. It can also be a transformation that will be characterized by the quality of processes. I guess the point I'm making is that the processes are just as important as the outcome. Um, and the science, I guess, that we want, the, the, the science that we want is also science that should be a democratic science. In other words, um, it's a federating science, um, a science that would unify people. Um, so it's not a science that would demarcate between the haves and the have not but it's a science that would really federate um, all the people, especially people that are living in worlds where technology is completely absent. Um, so in raising this um, ambition level um, and in setting the bar quite high, I think we're looking to science to be at that center stage uh, of the future we want. We've talked a lot about sustainable development and what that means. Um, and what we would like to see is how can science rally, rally and, and unify um, people in developing countries in a way that they can also take advantage um, of many of the um, technological advancements that we're seeing. Um, I think as a global society, we definitely cannot afford to keep the bottom billion on the periphery um, whilst we drive on. So we have to find a ways of ensuring that um, we share the knowledge. Um, so without um, further ado, I would like to start off by introducing our distinguished um, speaker, um, Dr. Yuan Li is President Emeritus and Distinguished Research Fellow of Academia Sinica in Taiwan. He's also University Professor Emeritus at University of California, Berkeley, and President-elect of International Council for Science. Dr. Lee has received numerous awards and honors, including a 1986 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. He has also, re he has also received Dr. Honoris Causa from 39 universities, I was talking to him just now. It said 37 on my note, but he's got 39 and about to receive another one tomorrow. And elected to be a member from various academies throughout the world. He's also held position as professor of chemistry at the University of Chicago, University of California, um, and on his bio, one of the things that we were just talking about as well is that um, although he's a great scientist, he takes great pride in interacting with students um, and has derived and continues to derive a lot of pleasure from interacting with, um, with, with students. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Yun, Yuan Li. It is really impossible to overstate the importance of the question at the heart of this summit. 
how can we attain energy, water, and food security for all in a time of changing climate? This morning, Mr. Kofi Annan mentioned Oxfam recently reported that the world's 85 richest individuals own as much wealth as the poorest 3.5 billion. That's just shocking, especially when 1.3 billion people don't have electricity and 2.5 billion live less than $2 a day. This level of inequality and poverty is unacceptable. Everyone deserves to live a decent life, secure in the basic necessities of energy, water, and food. Unfortunately, there's a big complication. Even with billions in poverty, the rest of us are already consuming too much and overloading the earth. This is something we have to face. We are overloading the earth. You see, decades of scientific research show that our planet is a complex life support system. Life exists on Earth only because this system functions and provides services. And actually, that function is really a complicated system of sun and Earth and how sunshine recycles all the biomaterials on the surface of the Earth. But humans are seriously messing with the system. Human impact on nature has exploded across the board, from deforestation to land use. And this pressure is seriously disrupting the system. The climate is warming. Species and habitats are dying. Disaster caused by extreme weather events are intensifying. If this continues, at some point, their system might not be able to support human life, let alone human prosperity. What does this mean for a hope to attain energy, water, and food security for all? It means that we must totally transform the way we develop. If we, if we continue the current way of development and get nine billion people by the mid-century, an American or European level of consumption, we will definitely destroy the Earth. For everyone to live well on a limited planet, we must transform development. But what would this look like? Well, it should fulfill three conditions. First, it must preserve a healthy planet Last year, a group of top scientists led by David Griggs argued that sustainable development should be development that meets the needs of the present while safeguarding the Earth's life-supporting system on which welfare of current and future generations depends. In other words, protecting the Earth is not something nice to do once you get rich. It is the first absolute and non-negotiable condition for human survival. Second condition, we must put a limit on growth. Since the Brundtland Commission in 1997, we have had many definitions of sustainable development, but none of them ever addressed two critical factors what we mean by development and what we mean need. One country pursued happiness with limited consumption, while another one wants luxury with unlimited consumption. Which one is development? Both? How much energy do people need? When I was young, 
during the Second World War, living the sun without electricity would just depend on sunshine. A sleeping person can survive on 100 watt, continuously supplied. But the average American consume 100 times that, more than 10 kilowatts. A project in Switzerland thinks everyone should be able to live well on 2,000 watt. Of course, if the society is organized right and we know how to use energy efficiently, which is the right level of need? You see, if we don't define development and need, they can mean anything. If you see a boy in Los Angeles, and if you ask, what is your essential need? You said, I need a car, otherwise I cannot function. Yet in Africa or part of Asia, they do need food, water, and energy. They can develop and need can mean anything, like having the big mansions, many cars, buying new gadget every year. That could be development. That could be what we need. And then our consumption explodes, and it did. In the 20th century, global consumption of resources grew by eight times as population grew by four times and per capita consumption double. Well, in that process, as I mentioned, we have started to overload the earth. Sunshine cannot recycle what we produce back to nature any longer. By 2050, experts project there could be 9.6 billion humans, almost 40% more. Many people say, it. many scientists say, it. well, with improved diet and living standard, we just need to increase the food production by 80% by 2050. And you said that the, re the Green Revolution proved Mauritius wrong. Science and technology can play miracles. But as a scientist, I have to say I'm sorry, but that is unlikely to happen again. Science shows that the climate change will reduce resource availability, not increase it, mainly because we have been damaging the ecosystem environment continuously. And although in 1990, we said we are going to reduce the carbon dioxide emission, but now if you compare to the level emission in 1990, we increased 60%. So scientists cannot play miracles if we keep on damaging our living environment. We live on a finite planet where infinite growth is not possible. So as we transform development, we must put a limit on growth, especially population and consumption growth. Of course, consumption growth could achieve by improving the energy and material usage efficiency. Back in 1994, 58 science academies from around the world met here in Delhi and later issued a statement to, to make exactly this point. Then in 2012, just before Rio Plus 20, 105 academies organized by inter academy panel issued the, ex the exact same request that we have to control population and consumption. This is the second condition, lower both population and consumption growth. The third condition is equality and justice. When humanity as a whole, is consuming way too much, but three billion of them get
get almost nothing. Something is seriously wrong. In such an unequal world, it's no wonder that people don't feel a sense of ownership of the earth. For everyone to live a decent life on this limited earth, development must be equitable. This requires that the rich country cut their consumption and emission drastically. At the same time, the developing country cannot follow the Western model of development. We must find a new way. Gandhi once asked for India to achieve Britain's standard of living, how many Earths would it have to colonize? He also mentioned that the Earth provides enough for every, man, every man's need, but not everyone's greed. So this is a message I leave with you. If we wish to secure energy, water, and food for all, but still preserve our Earth system, we must totally transform the way we develop. Yes, the rich country must come back, but Asia, Africa, and other regions need to develop. They have the right to develop, but must also shift to a new way of development. We all have to. And we have to work together. The biggest threat we face is no longer each other. We spend trillions of dollars trying to prevent enemies go across the border. But it's our own unsustainability threatening all of us that will be the major enemy we will be facing. So defense is not defending from each other. We have to defend from the calamity that global climatic change will bring upon us. This is a global crisis, and it demands global responses. I'm happy to say that the global science community is already mobilizing with massive research efforts to produce useful knowledge and real solutions. One example is Future Earth. It's a global research program that my organization, the International Council for Science, known as ICSU, has initiated together with the International Social Science Council, Development Forum, and UN agencies like UNESCO, UNDP, UNU, and WMO. But it won't mean much unless we turn knowledge into real action. And this is the gathering that I find most exciting because we seem to gear to trying to make connection of knowledge into action. And we better do it soon. Science shows that if we don't turn don't turn away from unsustainable development in the next few years, 10 years, it will be too late. How will future generation judge us then? The other day, I was thinking in Rio plus 70, maybe 50 years from now, all the generation might say that they die us, and young generation might say, you, you had a chance to transform the world, transform the human society, but you didn't, and we are suffering. How will future generation judge us then? For the sake of us all, let's start the transformation today, and let's work together across the national border and transform the society to make it sustainable and livable and wonderful for the next generation. Thank you very much.